Dawn breaks over New Delhi. The air hums with quiet movement. Trucks roll toward factories. Screens glow in offices. Laws are being written in silence. Somewhere across the ocean, the lights of Chicago, Houston, and Los Angeles still burn, unaware that a single decision made here, today, will ripple through them tomorrow. The world is still, but the markets are listening. Because when India signs, the world reacts. It began with pressure, years of negotiation, quiet frustration over unfair terms, digital taxes, and the invisible chains of dependency. India's parliament floor, filled with calm resolve, passed a law few thought would come so soon, a policy to favor domestic manufacturing and phase out selected U.S. imports, microchips, medical tech, processed fuels, agricultural inputs. It wasn't anger, it was strategy. For decades, the United States exported the tools India needed to build, but India learned, adapted, and now produces its own steel, electronics, and solar arrays. The apprentice has become the engineer. And in Washington, whispers began. What happens when the buyer turns maker? The Strategic Import Realignment Act carries a simple core. India will no longer import non-critical goods from countries that don't meet its localization quota. 40% of production must happen within India by 2027. The finance minister's words echoed through global markets. If India must grow, it must build. India isn't isolating itself. It's forcing the world to move factories to its soil. For years, the West offshore production to China. Now India is flipping the script, demanding the world offshore to India. Can a single developing nation really bend the supply chain to its will? Six American states are about to find out. On the Gulf Coast, tankers once left daily, carrying liquefied natural gas to Asian markets. India was among their biggest clients. But the new trade law favors contracts with the Middle East and Africa. Pipelines slow. Terminals wait. The numbers on the boardroom screens no longer glow green. The silence of machinery can be louder than protest. Texas, energy capital of America, home to the world's largest refineries. But those refineries run on catalysts and chemical compounds. 30% sourced from India's industrial corridor between Gujarat and Maharashtra. When India reclassified those materials as strategic reserves, U.S. imports plunged 45% overnight. Refinery operators in Houston now pay double for replacements from Europe. The ripple effect, gas prices climb, manufacturing margins shrink. A Texas oil executive admits, we never thought India would weaponize supply chains like this. The petrochemical industry employs over 400,000 Texans directly. When input costs double, margins evaporate. Smaller refineries consider shutting down. Larger ones lobby Washington for emergency interventions. But India isn't backing down. The petrodollar era taught America to fear OPEC. Now, a new force emerges, the Indian policy of economic control. Down south at Port of New Orleans, container traffic to India drops by 62%. Shipyards that handled petrochemicals and plastics now stand still. A dock worker says, we used to unload Indian steel. Now it's all gone to Vietnam. Local businesses close. The state loses an estimated $4.7 billion in trade value within six months. Louisiana's ports are lifelines. When trade flows dry up, it's not just the jobs at the docks. 
its trucking companies, warehousing operations, customs brokers and shipping insurance firms. Entire communities built around global commerce face existential questions. Ports are lungs of economies. When trade stops, it's not the water that's still, it's the breath of a nation. In the heartland, farmers lean against empty silos. India's new agricultural rule bans certain subsidized grain imports, part of its push for food independence. For states that grew billions in export revenue, it's not a ban, it's a drought. Iowa exports over $1.4 billion in soybeans and animal feed to India annually. India's new import rules now require 60% of animal feed ingredients to be locally sourced. The result? U.S. shipments halted, silos overflow, and prices drop below viability. Farmer Mike Jensen stands by his empty grain trucks. He says they used to go to Mumbai. Now they go nowhere. Corn meant for Mumbai sits unshipped. The horizon feels wider and quieter, but the land remembers every contract broken by progress. Iowa's agricultural economy revolves around export markets. When India closes its doors, prices crash domestically. Farmers default on loans. Equipment manufacturers see orders collapse. Small town banks feel the pressure. The entire ecosystem built around global trade starts to crack. Nebraska faces similar tremors. Wheat exports that once fed India's growing middle class now rot in storage facilities. Agricultural equipment sits idle. Processing plants reduce shifts. The American bread basket finds itself with too much bread and nowhere to send it. Trade wars rarely start with weapons. They start with paperwork and end in silence across farmlands. What happens to the American heartland when the Indian market shuts its gate? Technology once flowed east from Silicon Valley and Wall Street. Algorithms, analytics, patents. Now, India's data sovereignty law demands that critical software be built, stored, and processed within its borders. U.S. tech giants stare at unfamiliar restrictions. Servers go dark overseas. New data centers rise in Bangalore. Trade once built bridges, now it tests loyalties. Silicon Valley's chip design houses rely on India's rare earth-based polishing powders and low-cost testing centers in Bengaluru and Hyderabad. Now, under the new law, India prioritizes domestic chip manufacturing, refusing export licenses for non-partner nations. In Fremont, a manager at a semiconductor startup said, Our test cycle used to take three weeks. Now, with India's embargo, it's six months. Stock prices dip, contracts freeze, and as production delays spread, layoffs begin in San Jose. The impact is immediate. California's tech sector, worth over $500 billion, suddenly faces bottlenecks it never anticipated. Venture capital slows, IPOs get delayed, and the state that invented the future finds itself waiting on permits from New Delhi. The Golden State built the digital world, but even digital dreams depend on physical minerals dug out of Indian soil. In New York, the collapse isn't physical, it's financial. Investment firms with billions in Indian equities now face unpredictable regulations. India's made here or leave law spooks Wall Street. The rupee strengthens while U.S. funds retreat. By March 2025, India overtakes the U.K. as the world's fifth largest equity market by capitalization. An analyst at J.P. Morgan murmurs, we underestimated India's political will. It's not protectionism, it's recalibration. Hedge funds rebalance portfolios. Pension funds face unexpected volatility. The assumption that emerging markets would always play by Western rules suddenly looks naive. For decades, capital dictated policy. In 
2025, policy began dictating capital. If money can move anywhere, what happens when laws built invisible walls? 3,000 Boeing components are made or assembled in India. Under the new law, India demands that every exported aerospace part carry at least 40% Indian value addition. Otherwise, export tax doubles. For Boeing in Seattle, that means hundreds of delayed parts, millions lost per week. Engineers scramble for substitutes from Europe, but the lead time stretches from 14 days to 9 months. The result? Planes grounded, contracts delayed, morale sinking. Washington State's economy is deeply intertwined with aerospace. Boeing alone employs over 70,000 people there. When production slows, it's not just factory workers who suffer. It's the diners near the plants, the real estate agents, the local suppliers. A regional recession looms. Aerospace once defined America's global dominance. Now, its wings depend on foreign bolts. Can the sky itself become a hostage of economic nationalism? Boston's biotech corridor relied on India's pharmaceutical intermediates, chemical compounds essential for lab testing. Under the new policy, India halts exports to non-partner countries unless joint manufacturing agreements are signed. MIT spin-offs and startup labs face a shortage of reagents. Clinical trials freeze. A young researcher confides, we didn't think geopolitics could stop biology. Massachusetts leads America in life sciences innovation, but innovation requires raw materials. When those materials get caught in trade disputes, breakthrough discoveries get delayed. Cancer research stalls. Vaccine development slows. The human cost becomes impossible to calculate. Innovation needs molecules, not just ideas. And sometimes molecules follow flags. Can science stay global in an era of strategic nationalism? Europe watches, quietly supportive, seeing a world less dependent on one power. Africa listens, learning how to write its own rules. And in Washington, debates turn to subsidies, countermeasures, and the uncomfortable question, what if the balance never returns? In Brussels, confusion. In Beijing, applause. In Washington, alarm. Global supply chains begin to reroute through Southeast Asia. Vietnam, Indonesia, and the UAE position themselves as middlemen for restricted trade, but they can't match India's labor scale or policy depth. By mid-2025, India's export income from localized industries surges 28%. Meanwhile, six major U.S. states show GDP dips between 1.2 and 2.8%. China watches closely. If India succeeds, other developing nations might follow. Brazil, Indonesia, Nigeria, all observing whether economic sovereignty can be reclaimed through policy, not conflict. It's not an act of hostility. It's a declaration of self-reliance. India has become the world's new gatekeeper of growth. When emerging nations stop following the rules, do they start writing them? Amid graphs and headlines, there are people. An Indian engineer in Pune who just got promoted to lead a U.S. contract once handled in California. A Louisiana welder looking for work. A Boston researcher waiting for reagents that never arrive. Trade wars are fought in data, but lived in human time. The slow seconds of uncertainty, the silent nights of waiting. A California software engineer tweets, Lost my job because of Indian rare earth exports. Never thought I'd be a casualty of geopolitics. An Indian factory worker in Gujarat says, We're finally building for ourselves, not just for export. It feels different. A Texas refinery worker stares at the Gulf. My grandfather worked here. My father worked here. I don't know if my son will. An Iowa farmer looks at his fields. Three generations planted for the world. Now the world doesn't want what we grow. Globalization once promised connection. Now it delivers confrontation. 
Is this the cost of a multipolar world or its birth? In Mumbai's stock exchange, the numbers flicker, steady and bright. India's exports to the global south surge. Its digital rupee begins trials across borders. Meanwhile, six U.S. states, Texas, Louisiana, Iowa, Nebraska, California, New York, feel the tremor first. Not collapse in ruins, but a quiet contraction. Jobs pausing, shipments delayed, investors unsure which direction to look. Economists call it readjustment, but to families whose livelihoods ride on trade winds, it feels like a tide going out. Still, both nations remain bound by something deeper than trade, need. The world is too intertwined to tear apart completely, yet each new law redraws the map of power. By late 2025, diplomatic talks resume. The U.S. offers India a revised trade framework, fewer tariffs, more tech transfer. But India refuses to backtrack. Its message? We no longer export opportunity, we build it here. And for the first time since the Cold War, an Asian democracy dictates the pace of American industry. Negotiations stall. Both sides claim moral high ground. India argues it's simply doing what America did in the 19th century, protecting infant industries. America argues it's disrupting a rules-based order that lifted billions from poverty. Neither side blinks. Empires don't collapse in explosions. They collapse in negotiations. What happens when dependence becomes destiny? Every empire rewrites its contracts. Every generation redefines fairness. India's law is not an act of war. It's an act of arrival. For the first time, a nation once ruled by others sets the terms for itself. Across the ocean, six states adjust their ledgers, waiting for the next current. From the ports of New Orleans to the labs of Boston, six U.S. states now face the fallout of a world that no longer orbits Washington. India's law is more than economics. It's a signal that nations are reclaiming production, power, and pride. The 2025 trade fallout isn't just about goods. It's about identity. Who makes? Who depends? Who decides? Because in the end, no economy collapses forever. It shifts, evolves, learns. The earth beneath us does the same. Even the silence of change carries the sound of creation. So, as the world rewires itself, one question remains. Can two democracies survive as competitors, or must they learn to share the century? You've witnessed the quiet turning of a global chapter. The next begins where power meets patience. This film is based on publicly available data, verified reports, and independent analysis. It reflects economic trends, not political endorsement. Which state or country do you think will adapt first? Share your thoughts below. Subscribe, stay curious, and stay aware.